call it thermoelectric transport in electronic junctions. driven by what we call telegraph noise. So I'll, I'll uh, define the problem in a very simple way. Suppose you think of two leads, and these are like two fermionic bars. So this, this lead is the left lead, and you have the right lead. And you define this left lead in terms of its temperature and a chemical potential. And you also what you call a partial weight, which you calculate from the self-energy that I will indicate here. So this is the, called the partial weight. And similarly, the right lead also has a temperature and a chemical potential and uh, a partial weight like this. And you have your Fermi distribution function going like that. Right. And then you couple the two leads by something like a quantum dot, or it's a junction. And this quantum dot has an energy which you write, so it's, D stands for the dot, and it's an explicitly time-dependent energy. It has a static part and has uh, an ener uh, energy U, and this is stochastic. And in particular, we'll assume it to be like a telegraph noise, a telegraph noise is something like a dichotomic Markov process or a two-state jump process that I will define shortly. So what is our aim? Our aim is to understand how by pumping this energy of this localized level, we can create particle and energy transfer between this system and the two bars. And uh, so now, uh, I'll just write down the full Hamiltonian. So the full Hamiltonian for the problem is that you have the dot, okay? So the dot energy is given here, epsilon d of t, and you write it in second quantized notation like d dagger t, and then you have tunneling terms. The tunneling terms will be transferring uh, things from this dot to the, let's say, the right path. And so now you have operate, so you have an energy which you call dp. So you sum over all momentum states, and you have uh, d dagger times the creation operator for fermions for the right path, and you have Hermitian adjoint. And of course, you also have the free fermionic system which is epsilon p, cp dagger cp, and you write down the same thing for the left path. So the left path will also have uh, something like b, now you call it k, uh, d dagger ck plus its Hermitian adjoint, and you also have uh, the free fermionic term epsilon k ck dagger ck. So this is, these are your tunneling terms because you'll allow you to have tunneling of the electrons from the localized level to the two bats. And so now you're, this is your full Hamiltonian. This is an open quantum system. If you look at it from, this, from the point of view of the dot, and you further have perturbed the dot energy in terms of this uh, uh, two-state jump process. So now the interest in the system was, uh, as I said, to calculate particle and energy currents. Uh, the earlier work showed that if this is an oscillatory electric field, and then you average the quantities like currents over a complete cycle, uh, you don't actually get an energy current. What we showed, and this is done along with Ora and Tim Ullman, this is on 
internet collaboration with them, like my old collaborators, and they have a postdoc, Devashri Choudhury, and Amnon Aharoni. This appeared last year in PRB, November 2017, and I will just tell you uh, the results. The results are the following. That, uh, so, so how do you calculate the particle current? Essentially, you look at the rate of change of the population of on the dot, on, on uh, the, the left path, the right path, and so the sum over all them, the total particle number is conserved, and so the total current will, of course, be zero in the stationary state, but you can actually calculate the exchange of particles from the dot to the bath. And the energy also is calculated. Similarly, you look at the full Hamiltonian, and in fact, write down equations of motion for average CK dagger CK, CP, DP, CP dagger CP, P dagger D, etc. And then you add the energy, and that's like the total, since it's the energy flux, energy per unit time, that's how you define as the total power that is supplied by the, by the, the telegraph noise. So how do you define your xi of t? Xi of t, as I said, is a two-state stationary Markov process. So if you take a sample, an ensemble, and take a shot, a camera shot of how xi of t behaves as a function of time, so it jumps at random between the two values, one and minus one. It may stay at plus one for some time. And then it jumps to minus one, goes up again to plus one. It may stay there for some time, and it does that sort of thing, okay? So it does it. So therefore, you can say also that at random instants of time, which are like T1, T2, T3, et cetera, uh, you have a Poissonian sequence of pulses and so now if you take the time segment and in fact do the average of that and take its inverse, that characterizes what you may call a jump rate. And this kind of a noise is uh, interesting. You can actually calculate exactly the probability matrix which solves into uh, something like rate matrix W of T is a two by two matrix. Uh, this is what satisfies what is called a chapman kolmogorov equation for a stationary Markov process. In this case, you have a two by two representation of this matrix, which is very simple to calculate analytically. And that has, uh, for instance, a T equal to zero. This cannot have any off diagonal elements. So it, it goes like P plus minus p plus exponential minus gamma t. And uh, so as time t goes to infinity, this goes to zero, and you have detailed balance, so you get p plus here. You have p minus, minus p minus, a to the minus gamma t here. And the diagonal elements would give you one at time t equal to zero. So that's it, that is one. Because at t equal to zero, this is one, so p plus p minus is one. This is p minus plus p plus exponential minus gamma t. And p plus and p minus are just the Boltzmann weights for these two values of plus one and minus one. And we considered an asymmetry, sorry, asymmetry in the uh, probabilities. So you have plus minus uh, half beta. Beta is inverse temperature and delta divided by two cosh. It's a two-state system, Boltzmann factors. And so we can actually look at various temperatures and look at various values of P plus and P minus. Let me just summarize this to you for the results. So what we plot along the y-axis is the average power on the dot divided by something like what you call the uh, mean squared electric field and so this mean square electric field is u squared plus the variance of this noise. And so that you can easily show, show uh, you know, in this model, this is simply equal to one because psi is a plus minus process, so this is just one. And this average is simply p plus uh, minus p minus. 
And so if you work it out, you show that this is 4u squared p plus p minus. So that's what you divide by. And in the y, in the x-axis, what you plot is this energy u that you have, uh, which is the strength of that fluctuating uh, energy. And you divide it by gamma, and gamma is the total partial weight. So gamma is, in fact, gamma L plus gamma R. I should make a couple of remarks on this dichotomic Markov process, the telegraph process. It actually is more general than the usually assumed white noise, uh, because if you calculate correlation functions of the noise with respect to this P of T, you'll have exponential correlation. So it's like a colored noise problem. But there's a limit when these pulses are occurring very rapidly, then, in fact, you can also go to the limit of a white noise for this problem. The calculational scheme that we use for calculating particle current and energy current is this very popular now non-equilibrium Green's function method due to Keldish, and we have experts here, Avishek Bhar, Vijay Agarwal, et cetera. So just finish in half a minute to, to, do, to draw this diagram. So you have 10, 20, 30 here, and it, what you do is you plot, let's say, for gamma equal to 1. That is the jump rate gamma is equal to 1. Uh, you take a value of psi bar. It's also 0 0.5. So that defines, I mean, that is obtained from by fixing the temperature, the values of P plus and P minus, because I told you that psi bar is P plus minus P minus. And this is a very interesting result, that if this is 0 0.05, this is 0 0.10, 0 0.15, then uh, this power is very clear that if gamma is equal to zero, then there's nothing, so the power absorbed will, of course, go to zero. But even for u equal, and, and, and even for when u is very large, u is very large is like the static limit, because u is very large compared to gamma, then within, uh, well, you know, uh, within one time segment, your energy has not fluctuated, and so you get result where the power actually goes through a maximum and then goes down to zero. So this is a regime in which for gamma equal to one, u is sufficiently small, so the thing is jumping pretty rapidly within the time scale determined by u, and this is something like the emotional narrowing limit that people in NMR consider, and, and this curve is for a value of epsilon minus mu. Epsilon is fixed by this, and mu is the chemical potential. We have chosen mu well to, to be the same as mu r for the left and the right bars, and you actually renormalize the energy, and this value is 0 0.1. So your energy in the dot is slightly above the Fermi energy for the two bars, and so there's, there's interesting result that you actually have an increase in the power absorbed. Uh, when you jack up this epsilon minus mu over gamma to a slightly higher value, you, you see something like this. So this is for epsilon minus mu over gamma, something like one. And then finally, for another value, uh, we have monotonic decrease in the power absorbed, and that's the value which is about five. So this, these are the results, and uh, I'll stop here take questions. Speak. What determines the scale? I mean, this U. Uh, so what determines this value of uh, where you have this uh, peak? This, yeah. yeah. So th th this is actually the, the scale is that it's something like uh, U squared. I mean, it basically Have, see, you, you have two resonances now. If the xi is not fluctuating very rapidly, uh, the earlier the resonance was only at epsilon. Now you have epsilon plus u or epsilon minus u. However, if you fluctuate that plus and minus u pretty, pretty rapidly, you get mostly averaged over. And this is the characteristic energy scale over which you see the uh, So uh, I just had one question. So I also say that. Uh, just one, since you asked the question, 
I say that uh, you can also see how you can generate a telegraph noise on a more microscopic basis. In fact, you, can, you could think of it also as a, like a spin half impurity, and you have a spin boson kind of model, which is what the Agarwal and Manas uh, were talking about earlier. So uh, the, the telegraph noise can be viewed as a limiting case of something like a spin boson. Uh, so, uh, often in quantum dot systems, they have something called charge noise. Um, so, uh, is this kind of representing charge noise or is it a different thing? That's one question. And the other question is, um, uh, there are probably experiments where you can drive the quantum dot, but it's not a stochastic drive. It's, uh, it's, it's just a periodic drive or something. You, ED is just ED cosine omega t. Is there any experiment in which you can drive it stochastically? Um, so, two questions you asked. The first one was on the qubit, and if you have charge fluctuations to mimic a telegraph noise. And that's what motivated us, that is, uh, Orion Tin, uh, Amnon Aharoni, and Shmuel Gurovitz, and we looked at this process as another application of a telegraph noise. That, that is a paper that we published in 2010 to the end. It is, in fact, a lot of similarities with what you were discussing yesterday. Uh, your second question was, indeed, we were motivated to look at this problem by these experiments where you have oscillatory electric field, and Sanchez and others have written review articles, and there, actually, they did not see any energy current when they average over the complete cycle. We found that there is this current, so we're talking to some experimentalists in, in Weizmann Institute where we could generate the telegraph. So if you if you take the white noise limit, uh, this peak is still there? I mean, so is it robust? Uh -huh. So this is, in fact, something like the white noise limit. The Shumilan was asking me if this becomes very large, then actually uh, the, uh, oh. it's, uh, the Lorentzian of the correlation, in fact, has a limit which is, goes like a delta function. So that's the white, kind of white noise limit of the two-state jump process. But you know, the white noise actually is like a Gaussian process. Right, and this right. Is a Gaussian right, it's a point. Right. And the other thing is, uh, so if we take, uh, I think you probably mentioned that instead of uh, this noise, if we have the periodic driving, then you're saying that on an average, the power absorbed is zero, right? Particle current is still non-zero, but the power absorbed on the average goes to zero. And we found somewhat surprising result, uh, intuitively surprising, that now the telegraph noise is actually supplying power to the two reservoirs. And depending on the two individual couplings, mm -hmm. and gamma. the stronger coupling, right. the left reservoir, in fact, you create a temperature gradient in the system because of the telegraph. OK, let us uh, thank the speaker. and. Uh,